Hi, I'm Joe Saunders with Miniature Landscape Hobbies, and in this episode, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to paint some monster models for the Silver Bayonet, the awesome game of Gothic Napoleonic Horror. Let's get to it. Miniature Landscape Hobbies is proudly supported by these sponsors. Christmas 2023 has come and gone, and what a Christmas it was! You see, my son Hastings, who's also a bit of a wargamer, bought me my own copy of Silver Bayonet. So we set about playing some games, and what I found was that Silver Bayonet is awesome. In fact, it was so awesome that I took all my Christmas money and ordered every single silver bayonet model I could get a hold of. The North Star miniature silver bayonet models are really, really cool, and I went to work very quickly painting them up so I could get down to some games. In this episode, I decided that I was going to get out some of the monsters, and I was going to paint them up for you so you could see my methods. Why the monsters and not the warbands? Well, as the warbands are the star of the game, I just went ahead and painted most of them up ahead of time off camera, but I thought it might be kind of interesting to see the process for painting monsters, because honestly, I haven't painted a miniature of a monster for probably 15 years. So with all that out of the way, let's get out these awesome new North Star miniatures and get to work. I'd like to take a quick moment to thank my Patreon supporters. Without their assistance, miniature landscape hobbies would not be possible. If you would like to learn more about the benefits of becoming a Patreon supporter, please check the link in the video description. As I mentioned, I purchased as many of the North Star Silver Band net models as I could find. I live in Canada, so these are pretty rare here, but I did manage to get my hands on the revenants and goblins. First up, I unpackaged the models and trimmed the flash with a sharp knife. When this was complete, I then glued each model to a 20mm by 20mm base, which is the standard that I use for my Napoleonics. Next, I would need a way to hold the models to prepare them, so I did the same thing I always do. I super glued them to a nail. With this done, it was time to prime the figures. Army Painter Speed Paints would be doing the majority of the heavy lifting on this project, so I primed everything with a medium gray. When the primer was good and dry, I got out my MIG Dio Dry Brush light gray and dry brushed all of the models. I then followed this with a light dry brush of Dio White. These awesome paints are made for dry brushing, and they largely eliminate the chalkiness that can sometimes come back to haunt you if you've not prepared your brushes properly. Now my Zenithal foundation was laid down. Speed paints work so well because they're translucent, but still tint the underlying layers. This allows a nicely prepared model that has a lot of underlying contrast to really pop with only one coat. Since we have a variety of monsters dressed in ways ranging from period civilian to military dress, I'm going to need a good selection of colors. To deal with this, I get out a number of earth tones, cream colors, grays, and some greens, and of course the requisite blues and red for French and British Napoleonic uniforms. For the most part, I applied these straight out of the bottle, zooming in on each subject here and there, blocking in the models where it seemed sensible. It's on projects like these where speed paints excel. With traditional layering, it would be a laborious process revisiting each model in turn to build each color from lightest to darkest. Fortunately, though, speed paints and other zenithal paints like Color Express or Citadel Contrast can do the job of three to four layers of regular acrylics in just one pass. Or they can almost do this. You see, I feel that with 28mm and smaller scales, 
you really do need a final sharp highlight that speed paints just don't provide. This is no issue though, you just need to mix a new highlight and apply it with a fine brush. For the browns like dark wood or brownish decay, I add 3 to 1 deck tan to the underlying speed paint color. For the camel green that I used here and there, I also use the same ratio with deck tan as well. For the French uniforms, these got High Lord Blue to start, and they were highlighted by adding Ice Blue to the mix. Any of the predominantly white areas, like the uniform pants, were blocked in with Battleship Grey and highlighted by adding white. I must say though, I didn't like this effect that much. It looked too clean for what is basically a zombie. To help with this, I used Army Painter Soft Tone over top my previous layers, and this looked more the part. I think now we need to talk specifically about the red of the British uniforms. For these, I laid down Slaughter Red first. When I mix a highlight for red though, I usually change the process. You see, if you combine a very light opaque paint like white or deck tan with red, you get pastel pink. And this does not really look like a proper highlight. To fix this, I always recommend using a flesh tone, in this case, luminous flesh. When you mix this into a red, you create almost a salmon color. This highlights better, though I'll often heavily thin the initial red to a glaze and brush it back over top of my work to unify the colors after they dry. From here, I was ready to tackle the small details. I started with the various shoes and hats, which got a slightly thin coat of grim black. Here and there, I added a small highlight by putting some deck tan into the black, but this was only required on the largest details. There are quite a number of buttons and some opalettes on some of these models, and I figured these would be a good spot to add a splash of color. To achieve this, these were painted with a 50-50 mix of Sand Gollum and Zealot Yellow. At this point, the clothing was pretty much done. But for the Revenants, things looked just a little too clean. As magic zombies go, these guys needed some weathering. I did this by taking an old brush and stippling a combination of mud brown and dark sand at random on shirts and pants. I knew I wanted a pale, bloodless zombie look for the Revenants, so I painted the models all luminous flesh. Over this, I layered Runic Grey speed paint. When this had dried, the models were just a little too pale, so I returned some warmth to them with Army Painter Flesh Wash. I was now pretty content with these, so I polished off the skin tones with a quick highlight of deck tan. And boom! instant undead monsters. Despite my success with the Revenants though, things came to a screeching halt when I realized that I had no idea how to paint the goblins skin. I had already put down a layer of luminous flesh on them while I did the Revenants, but that's as far as I got. These weren't Games Workshop goblins, so green seemed to be out. I know that Harry Potter and other fantasy settings have goblins that are usually regular flesh tones, but I wanted something different. So in the end, I just winged it. I mixed up Malignant Green, which is a yellow green, think sort of like Lime Gatorade, with a single drop of Camouflage Green. Why did I choose this? Well, because I don't think I've really ever used Malignant Green before, and I just wanted to give it a try. This got brushed on, and I held my breath while it dried. When the paint set though, I was pleasantly surprised. It came out a very alien yellow. I added a little depth to this with flesh wash and applied a quick luminous flesh highlight to the noses and foreheads, and I thought I had some pretty convincing goblins. As is usual with this style of painting, the details needed a boost to their definition so I moved to lining in. Taking black acrylic ink, I cut it 50-50 with airbrush flow improver. Then with a fine brush, I began tracing prominent details and the depths of the folds in the clothing. 
I also outlined around facial features and especially the eye sockets. The flow improver reduces the surface tension to help the ink flow right where you need it, and though this process is time consuming, it really helps make the model look interesting to the viewer. I wanted an otherworldly appearance for these models, so I decided to do some more work on their eyes. Taking white, I put a dot in the middle of each eye socket. For the goblins, I then filled this in with bright red. This created a very appropriate malevolent look. For the revenants, I used plasmatic bolt to create a glowing blue-green. Why this color? Well, teal shades are quite obviously the color of evil magic, right? Anyway, now I was down to just the metallics. Why did I wait for the metallics until the end? Well, the answer is pure laziness. I didn't want to change my paint water, after all. If you work with metallics, the reflective pigments will contaminate other colors, so I waited until I was done with all the other paints. I blocked in the metal areas on the weapons and blades with plate mail, then washed it all with Army Painter Blue Tone Shader. When this was dry, I simply followed up with a quick highlight of Shining Silver. Now the project was mostly done, so I went ahead and based the models. This isn't hard to do, but it is a subject I've already covered in detail, so click on the link here if you want to learn more. With the basing complete, now everything was ready to go. I applied a few layers of varnish to protect my work, and with that, I was done. Now I have a few revenants animated by evil energies to attack the living, and five rather malevolent looking goblins ready to torment any hapless human that disturbs them. These monsters will be headed to the table soon to provide opposition for my silver ban at war bands, and hopefully provide ours of gothic horror themed miniature gaming fun. If you'd like to learn more about basing miniatures, please watch this video, or consider watching this other video instead. Thanks for watching, and as always, remember to keep building life in miniature.